Ready for a deep dive into what makes a truly great leader? We're going way beyond the usual buzzwords today. Sounds good. We've got this article that breaks down the common threads among seriously impactful leaders. And I mean, we're talking everyone from Oprah to Elon Musk. And the best part, it's not about some magical leadership gene you're born with. Right. We're talking about five key aspects of leadership that anyone can actually learn and develop themselves. Yeah, that's what's so exciting about this approach. You know, it really kind of busts that whole myth of the mm -hmm. born leader, right? Yeah. Anyone can step up and, and develop these skills. I love it. So where do we even begin? Well, the first thing this article really digs into is visionary thinking. And it's not just about, you know, setting goals. It's about painting this picture of the future so clear, so exciting that Everyone else just gets swept up in it. Okay, that makes sense. It's like when I think about Steve Jobs, right? He wasn't just trying to build another gadget. He just had this, I don't know, this almost uncanny ability to see what people wanted, even before they even knew they wanted it. Exactly. And what's so fascinating about a guy like Jobs, he knew how powerful desire is, right? He didn't just create these products. He created this whole aura around them. Mm. Think about those iconic product launches, the sleek design, even the way he presented them like they were from the future. And people, they didn't just want an iPod. They had to have one. It's true. He created a whole experience, not just a product. And it makes me think of another visionary leader, Elon Musk. I mean, shooting for Mars, mm. sustainable energy on a massive scale. Those could easily seem impossible, but somehow makes you believe it. And that belief is key, right? Yeah. These visionary leaders, they don't just have goals. They build a shared mission. Take Nelson Mandela, for instance. His vision of a unified South Africa, free from apartheid, it sustained him. It sustained countless others through decades of struggle. And that's the power of that kind of vision. You know, it's not just personal ambition. It becomes everyone's mission. Yeah. You can't argue with the impact Mandela had, that's for sure. That unwavering vision, even with all that adversity, it's honestly incredibly inspiring. So we've talked about visionary thinking, but what about the human side of leadership, you know? Oh, absolutely. And that brings us to the next big thing the article talks about. Empathy and listening. And, you know, this might sound obvious, but it's way more than just being nice. Okay, I got to admit, when I first saw that one, I was a little thrown. I mean... What does Oprah Winfrey have in common with someone like Jacinda Ardern, right? I mean, their leadership style seems so different. It is interesting how two really different leaders can share that same core element of empathy, though. You've got Oprah connecting with millions, sharing her own experiences, being vulnerable, and making you feel like she gets you. And then you've got Jacinda Ardern leading with compassion and taking action during those moments of national crisis, like the Christchurch mosque shootings. You're right. It's not about having this one specific style. It's about that ability to really connect with people on a human level, no matter what's going on. That's it. And that connection, that feeling of truly being heard, it's so important for building a culture where people feel valued. You know what I mean? Like they well, matter. Okay, so it's definitely more than just surface level niceness, for sure. It's about building those real connections. Which, actually, that makes me think about another quality we see in great leaders. Resilience. Especially when things get tough, because, I mean, no leader gets off scot-free when things go sideways. No, not at all. Yeah. And this is where you see how important it is to not just weather the storm, but to pro project this sense of, we got this. You know, that calmness and resolve that makes everyone else feel like they can weather the storm, too. It's like resilience can be contagious. When you see a leader facing a crisis and they've got it handled, it's reassuring, right? Like, OK, we can totally get through this. But, you know, when you're talking about leaders, the stakes are so much higher. Imagine being Winston Churchill during World War II. Talk about pressure. I mean, Churchill during World War II, he's like the textbook example, right? He didn't just weather the storm. He basically projected this aura of we got this. Yeah. And that that inspired an entire nation to keep fighting, even when things looked really bleak. And it's not just about outward confidence either, right? It's about that inner strength, being able to navigate those really tough choices when it really matters. Exactly. And the thing is, resilience, it's like any other skill, right? You can build it up over time, practice it. Think about someone like Mary Barra, you know, the CEO of General Motors. Yeah. She took the reins during a wild time for the auto industry. Major product recalls a global pandemic the whole world shifting to electric vehicles. It takes some serious resilience to keep a company that big afloat through all that uncertainty. And it makes you realize that everyone faces these challenges, whether you're, you know, leading an entire nation or just trying to get through your day. For sure. And speaking of navigating change, 
that kind of brings us perfectly to our next leadership quality, mm. adaptability. In a world that just keeps throwing curveballs, being able to adapt, to change course, to really embrace new ideas, that's essential. Okay, so for prime example of adaptability in action, can we just take a second and talk about Amazon? I mean, picture it, right? It's the mid-90s, and Jeff Bezos is basically running an online bookstore out of his garage. I mean, back then, it seemed kind of niche, right? Right, like you're going to sell, what, books online? <laughs> It almost sounds funny now, but Bezos, he had this knack for not just adapting to a changing market, but seeing the changes before they happened. And a lot of times he was the one making those changes happen. And he wasn't afraid to just totally reinvent the business model, even if it meant, you know, disrupting his own success from books to basically, well, everything. It's remarkable how Amazon's evolved, all because of that adaptability. Absolutely. And that's what adaptable leaders do. They're not stuck in the past doing things the way they've always been done. They're always looking ahead. You know, asking what's next and how can we be a part of it? Or better yet, how can we lead the way? It's like Netflix, right? Talk about a company that changed everything. They totally gambled going from DVDs by mail to this whole streaming thing. And I mean, they changed how we watch movies and shows. They saw the writing on the wall and they went for it. I mean, Reed Hastings, the CEO, mm -hmm. he knew if they stayed stuck in that old way of doing things, they'd be finished, you know, no matter how successful they'd been. So they adapted, went all in on the future and it paid off big time. It's crazy. The other day I was like, what would Blockbuster even be like if it still existed? And then I was like, oh, right. They didn't adapt and well, now they're gone. And that's a really good point for everyone, not just leaders. Think about it, right? What are some of the ways you've had to adapt in your own life, your work, whatever it is? And maybe even more importantly, what did you learn from it? Because adaptability, it's like a muscle, right? The more you use it, the stronger it gets. It's about being open to those new possibilities, even when they feel a little scary, right? Okay, so for our final deep dive into these leadership qualities, let's talk about building a positive culture. And I gotta admit, this one always makes me think of Tony Sai, you know, the late CEO of Zappos. Oh yeah, Tony Sai, he really flipped the script on company culture, didn't he? Mm. Employee happiness, that was huge for him. He tried all kinds of things to make Zappos a place where people actually wanted to work. Like offering people money to quit if they weren't happy. Talk about a bold move. But honestly, he really seemed to understand that a positive work environment, it's not just some nice perk, it's good for business. It really is. And as unique as Zappos was, there are so many other companies who are realizing that a positive, supportive culture, it makes a difference. You know, Patagonia is another good example. Their commitment to the environment, it's not just marketing, it's woven into everything they do. Yeah, and it's like that saying, right? People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And when your whole company, top to bottom, believes in that why, I mean, that's powerful stuff. It really is. Yeah. And it attracts the best people, too. Think about it. People want to work for a company where their values line up. Yeah. You know, where they feel like they're part of something bigger. It's like that shared mission we were talking about before, but like company wide. And it's funny to bring it back around to Satya Nadella at Microsoft, right? Because changing the whole culture there, making it more about empathy and collaboration, it wasn't just some nice thing to do. It was a brilliant business move. It really boosted their innovation and performance. Exactly. It all comes back to the idea that a positive culture isn't about, you know, ping pong tables and free snacks. It's about creating a space where everyone feels valued and respected, where they feel like they can do their best work. And that's what gets those incredible results. It's like all these leadership qualities we've been talking about. They all kind of feed into each other, you know? They do. The best leaders, the ones who really make a difference, they usually embody a whole bunch of these qualities. Yeah. Visionary thinking, empathy, resilience, adaptability, building that positive culture. And the really cool thing is these aren't like magical traits you're born with. They're skills, things you can learn and practice. That's honestly super empowering. It means anyone can be a leader. I totally agree. It's not about waiting for someone to give you permission or hand you some fancy title, you know. It's about looking for those opportunities to lead in your own life, at work, in your community, wherever. So as we wrap up here, what's one thing you really hope our listeners take away from all of this? I'd say this. Leadership isn't this, like, mystical thing that some people just have and others don't. It's an active process. Okay. It's about cultivating these qualities in ourselves, recognize them in others, being inspired by those great leaders who came before us, and then finding our own way to make a difference, you know? Love that. Find your style, build those skills, and get out there and make things happen. Exactly. That's something we can all get behind. And on that note, thanks for joining us for another deep dive.
Until next time.